What type of a God tortures his own disciple to win a barter? What type of a God subjects his own follower to untold sadnesses and pain in order to prove to his opponent that he was right and his opponent, whoever that was, was wrong? Sadly, possibly sadly, the answer to that question is your God. And by extension, my God. If so be that you claim that the God of the Bible is your God. Does that fact sit comfortably with you? Is that okay? Are you well prepared to give a defense of this God to whomever might pose you that question? The question might come in the form of someone saying, I have encountered the God of the Bible. <laughs> Thank you very much. I have read about him firsthand. And he is the guy who killed all of a man's children to prove to his opponent that he was right and not wrong. I don't want anything to do with that God, if you don't mind. Do you have any reason to suggest that I should have anything to do with that God? What are you going to say? Because that question is going to be put to you, for some of you. It will be by will be put to you by your university friend. It will be put to you by your work colleague. It will be put to you by that sister in the ecclesia who has just lost her faith. It will be put to you by your own son. Are you ready? What are you going to say? And, and so what I want to do um, this week is see if we can all uh, step up our degree of readiness to answer that question with confidence without in any way cheating. And when I say cheating, I mean ignoring the issues in the book of Job or belittling the degree of his suffering or introducing extraneous ideas that aren't even there. There is an issue with seeing God's conduct in the book of Job. He causes untold distress to his faithful disciple. He seems to use his disciple as a pawn in some sort of celestial chess match to win a game against his opponent. That's one of the very many serious issues of the book of Job. Let's have a look at what it's provoked uh, some people to say about that. Here's a famous name for you, perhaps Carl Jung, a famous uh, psychiatrist and psychologist. A and I'll be fair with you, this talk is a little bit different uh, than the others that are going to be in this series. The others are entirely just rooting through Scripture to construct a consistent argument and a consistent solution to what we see in the book of Job. But uh, this evening, just by way of introduction, we're going to take a slightly broader fare and consider some uh, non-biblical students and uh, non-biblical scholars who've also spent a great deal of time looking at uh, the treaties of Job. A rather extraordinary conclusion uh, available from Jung the reason God doubts Job is because he projects his own unfaithfulness upon a scapegoat. It's an odd thing to say. It's very easy to say, oh, well, that man is obviously a fool. I need to hear nothing more from him. And I might understand why you might say that. But I want you to see uh, exactly uh, some of the reasonableness of the somewhat caustic opinions that are formed uh, by observers of Job. Maybe not so much that one, but have a look at Gilbert Murray here. He has uh, an interesting thing to say. The book begins with a mythological setting in which the story is represented as the result of a sort of bet upon the part of Satan that Job, while, he is, uh, while prosperous, is perfectly pious, he can be made to curse God if he is sufficiently tormented and afflicted. The Almighty enters into the spirit of this atrocious proposal and every type of torment is showered upon the innocent man. Here's his analogy. It is like torturing your faithful dog to see if you can make him bite you. Now, you might not like that appraisal, but you can probably see why he has been drawn to say that. And again, do you feel ready and confident to explain why that is not a, a fair assessment of the God in whom we trust? 
and a, a similar uh, synopsis here from an American philosopher. In outline, the story of Job is rather simple. A childishly conceived God, a childlike God, in fact, boasts about Job to his angel Satan as a child might about a dog. With a callousness, with a brutality, with a violence hard to equal in any literature, secular or divine, God, just to make a petulant point, proceeds to do almost everything the most villainous of beings could want. The inhumanity of the author, or of his God, if one prefers, has been almost matched by the insensitivity of those commentators who accept the prologue of the book of Job and do not feel a need to underscore an abhorrence of God's project and performance. I'm not here to put insightful uh, or, or controversial or contentious commentary in front of you, but again, although you may disagree sharply with that conclusion, you may see where it has come from if you've just read Job chapter 1 and been introduced to the proceedings there. Those are three men whom the world hold up as very wise, and I put them uh, before you as deliberate coincidence because we're going to meet three men uh, in the book of Job who consider themselves to be very wise and, and also speak some parts truth, but some parts uh, that go terribly astray. So how should we understand God's behavior towards Job? If you look through the many philosophical books that have been written about Job, the most common explanation, I've read about 40 analyses of Job, that's, that's, you know, that's all I've got to stand on, but it's quite a lot, they start to sound the same after that. I think you've seen pretty much the full spectrum uh, once you get to that number. Um, then the explanation is that the God of the Bible exists for those uh, authors to whom uh, they believe God exists, but he's not particularly interested in humanity per se. He's more like a remote scientist who's doing interesting things and concocting experiments. Uh, very similar to the Greek gods or the believers in Greek gods where uh, the gods were very removed from their subjects and toyed with them. The most common, as we focus down upon the Christian selection of that literature, we find that the most common Christian explanation is that the Old Testament God is judgmental and cruel, but the New Testament God is loving and kind. You may have encountered uh, that opinion, and that's very commonly expressed after one reads the Old Testament book of Job. That strikes me as somewhat patronizing, as if we're to suggest that we somehow observe the maturity of God throughout the scriptures, but that's the most common explanation we find. And as we focus down within the Christian spectrum and arrive at the uh, most common Christadelphian explanations from the relatively small amount of literature that we have on this particular subject, uh, we have sort of two forms of answers. One, that God is supreme and we have no right to question him. And that's often quoted in uh, context with the verse from Isaiah 45, Woe to those who quarrel with their maker. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? So that's uh, part A and part B, that it all worked for good for Job. To take a quote, it is not that God hates Job. On the contrary, God cares for all, including Job. Is God a friend to Job? Certainly. And a friend to us too, if like the ultimate Job, we confess our ignorance of his ways and rest instead in faith in his mercy. And I'm just wondering, is this the best that we can do? To say, God is in charge? That's certainly true. I, I wouldn't question that. We have no right to question him. I find that an interesting statement. I think the verse in Isaiah is really saying, do not quarrel with your maker. But there are many places in scripture in which God is inviting us to question him. And most of the most faithful men and women in scripture do work in terms of asking questions to God so that they may be educated. And you can see from the, the flavor of this language, it is not that God hates Job. It's a very defensive language. Many of the Christian expositions and Christadelphian expositions of Job tend to be incredibly defensive and say, please don't think that God's terrible. It's really not as bad as it looks. And I'm hoping that we can go better than just saying it's really not as bad as it looks and or he's supreme, so he's in charge, so, you know, don't, don't mess with him. Okay. So we're going to try and uh, uh, work, that's just a, a summary of what is, regardless of what we might agree with, um, and we're going to try and work a little bit beyond that point. And I think part of our problem might be is that we, uh, we are, those of us who've uh, spent some time in the Christadelphian community, uh, we encourage ourselves that we have answers, uh, biblical answers, to common questions. And I think in the, gener in the generic sense, that's, that's largely true. But Job poses some very hard questions, and perhaps it's not unreasonable for us 
to be actually honest and occasionally need to say, I don't have an answer for that question. Here's a quote that I, I found that was useful from an Anglican minister. There is an unhelpful decisiveness in some aspects of faith which gets in the way of meeting God in depth. There is an attempt to have everything buttoned up and secure. There is a defensive need to be sure. The book of Job, instead, brings us face to face with the living God and invites us to live in his light with all our logical gaps, untidy edges, and struggling faith. And that's not an unreasonable place to be when you read the book of Job. And, and if we're in that position, uh, I would certainly counsel and encourage you, do not be embarrassed or ashamed of such a position. That's a very honest appraisal, I think, of looking at the book of Job to start with. So I put that forward uh, quite deliberately. There are challenges uh, that Job raises, and, and one of them, perhaps most strikingly, is would we survive, and I mean spiritually, not physically, would we spiritually survive if we were visited with similar disasters as Job? Soren Kierkegaard, another philosopher, put it very ably when he said, I'll read his quote, he said, with regards to Job's trials, Perhaps you believe that such a thing cannot happen to you. Who taught you this wisdom? Or on what do you base your assurance? Do you put your confidence in God? So did Job. He was the Lord's confidant. Are you wise and understanding, and is this your confidence? Job was a teacher of many. Are you powerful? Is this your assurance of immunity? Job was reverenced by the people. Are riches your security? Job possessed the blessing of many lands. Are your friends your guarantors? Job was loved by everyone. Have you reflected on these thoughts? Or have you not rather avoided them, so that they might not extort from you a confession, which you now perhaps call a melancholy mood? And yet there is no hiding place in the wide world where troubles may not find you. And there has never lived a man who was able to say more than you can say, that you do not know when sorrow will visit your house. So be sincere with yourself. Fix your eyes upon Job. Even though he terrifies you, it is not this he wishes, if you do not yourself wish it. You still could not wish, when you survey your life and think of its end, that you should have to confess, I was fortunate, not like other men. I have never suffered anything in the world, and I have let each day have its own sorrows, or rather bring me new joys. Such a confession, even if it were true, you could still never wish to make. I, it would involve your own humiliation, for if you had been preserved from sorrow as no other had, you would still say, I have indeed not been tested in it. But still my mind has frequently occupied itself seriously with the thought of Job and with the idea that no man knows the time and the hour when the messengers will come to him, each one more terrifying than the last. And I think that's something we do need to consider. Do we believe in God purely because of the protection that we have received at his hand. Because for some, that protection appears to be absent. Should they then conclude that there is no God, or that their God does not care for them? Surely not, we would say. Then how can we reason this to be true? And when we read the book of Job, here's an interesting question. With whom do we associate? I don't know about you, but uh, your experience is probably similar to mine. I have met... Tens and tens, not hundreds, but tens and tens of brothers and sisters who have said, Job, I know about Job, I've been there. And I would never, I, I know that there will be some of you in this room who have suffered extremely and suffered in ways that I could only imagine, or perhaps I could not even imagine. And I would never speak lightly or carelessly in the face of that suffering. But it's interesting that we can often find people who will associate and say, I feel a familiarity with Job. And yet, the first thing we learn about him, in the opening verse of the book, the one thing that God wants to make directly clear to us, Job was blameless and upright, fearing God and shunning evil. And I don't think there's a person in this room, certainly not myself, who can say, yeah, that, that's, that's me. The whole point that was brought before us was, there was no way whatsoever that you could ever think Job was being punished by his sufferings because he essentially is presented, in essence, as a sinless man. So even though we're quick to associate with Job, we don't actually match his circumstances very well at all. 
and probably few of us have, su have suffered to the extreme degree to which he is pushed. Furthermore, I have never yet met the brother or the sister who has ever identified with the other three main human characters that exist in the book of Job. In fact, in every exposition I have read, I have seen nothing other than the author excoriate Job's three friends. And in an irony of ironies, and there's much irony in the book of Job, the moment we strongly criticize those three friends of Job, we become them. Because that's what they did. They saw a brother that they thought had, had, had made a mistake, and they slammed him. And we see them definitely making a mistake, because God gives us an assurance that they do. And we slam them. And we put as big a distance as possible between them and us. One thing we know from chapter 42, there's every suggestion they're going to be in the kingdom. And if, if we're extended the same wonderful grace, we're going to have to shake their hands and look them in the eye. So don't be too harsh. In fact, if there are any characters in the book of Job with whom I'm afraid I have a familiarity, it is those three friends, isn't it? The three friends who knew a few things, thought they knew a lot more than they did know, and got a little too overexcited about their own importance as they went along. Uh, I, I've seen such a man. He is, he is often found in my mirror. So, as we go through this book, I don't want to start pouring untold scorn upon these three friends of Job, even though they certainly do depart uh, from the path of speaking that which is right. Here's the other challenge that we face from the book of Job, and this is the way that I like to summarize it. We meet the interface of theology and experience. That sounds like a rather pompous and pretentious phrase, doesn't it? I apologize for that. It, it, this is where the rubber hits the road. We know what we believe, and we know what happens in our lives. But sometimes those two don't fit together any better than oil and water. They absolutely don't go together. Uh, and let's look at that from the book of Job. And, and, and when you see these numbers in green, they're always going to be chapter and verses. The book is written only when it's not from the book of Job. Okay? In Job 24, we're going to see Job explain his theology and his, explain his experience. And in so doing, he emphasizes uh, the, the height of his pain. Because the two don't go together at all. This is his theology. God drags away the mighty by his power. For a little while they are exalted, and then they're gone. They're brought low and gathered up like all others. They're cut off like heads of grain. And you'll recognize Psalms and other writings of faithful men who've noticed the correct theology. But Job says, but my experience is the exact reverse. Why does the Almighty not set times for judgment? Why must those who know him look in vain for such days? When daylight is gone, the murderer rises up and kills the poor and needy. In the night he steals forth like a thief. The groans of the dying rise from the city, and the souls of the wounded cry out for help. But God charges no one with wrongdoing. So there's Job's experience. I suggest to you it's not, an exp it's not a coincidence that they're from the same chapter. And so there is the interface, the fractious interface, between Job's theology and Job's experience. He says, I know what I believe, and every time I look at my life, I see the exact contradiction of what I believe to be true. And that's going to be true for every one of us at certain times in our life. Because what we believe is not always reproduced in the evidence of our physical lives before us. Why does this happen? But I'd still like to ask, why does impending disaster cause so many, perhaps not so many, hopefully brothers and sisters, but so many people to cry, there is no God. You, you've heard that cry, I know you have, and you've heard that coupled with a disastrous event in someone's life, perhaps someone you know and love, perhaps even yourself. Why does this happen? I'd like to suggest to you a, a little sort of philosophical explanation of why this might be. Because we know that the goodness or existence of God, if we're going to speculate on such a thing, cannot be a function of how luxurious our life is, for obvious reasons. For example, let's say we get a promotion, and you might often hear, yes, God is great, I got the job. God is great. You've heard that. You may even have said that. And yet when utter tragedy strikes, 
And perhaps there's no tragedy greater than a parent who loses a child physically. You might hear that cry, there is no God. Now, clearly, those two statements are, are not really teaching us anything because they happen all the time to different people. Even today, there is someone who has experienced a great joy and someone who has experienced a great sadness. So it can't be that God is good one day but non-existent the next and vice versa. So clearly, details of our circumstantial lives do not testify to the existence or non-existence of God. Otherwise, he would be constantly winking in and out of existence. So why then is this association made? Why is this reaction or these reactions, why are they common? Let me suggest to you what this may, what, what, why this may be so, and investigate your own mind deeply to find out whether there's anything that lurks inside that may be akin to this. I suspect what's happened is as society has shifted, and, and we, we are to some extent dragged along with it, we have defined our personal happiness as our God. I call it the, the God of personal happiness. And, and when that happens, there are three consequences. Firstly, the, the so-called proof that there is no God will invariably be something which the observer finds deeply troubling. I see a deeply troubling event, and a disaster impacts me, and I say, there is no God. No. In reality, there is no happiness. My happiness has been destroyed. My happiness has become absent. But because I've rather subconsciously, and perhaps not aware, made my happiness my God, I say, there is no God. So clearly then, any serious tragedy can induce a crash of faith in any person who is holding, however subliminally, that theology. If your happiness is linked to your belief in God, that God must fail. That God will fail. Because events will happen that will take your happiness away. And if you find in, in, in hours of deep distress that you're saying, I'm not sure I believe in God, that can only be, be because you've put your personal happiness on the throne. Because that's what's disappeared. Not God. That God will fail. And by extension, God himself, if he's to exist in that theology, is reduced to a cosmic, fr cosmic slave, I call it. I stand by the hospital bedside of my loved one, and I say, there's a God, keep them alive. What's God supposed to do? Oh, okay, right, I'll get right on it. I'll just cure that. If there's a God, that war won't break out. Oh, okay, I'll just clean that up, shall I? And God becomes our cosmic maid service to perform all the things that we need to happen to keep our happiness high to make sure we believe in God. That, I think, is the philosophy that has permeated our society and could potentially have permeated any one of us, myself included. And I think it has permeated me to a small extent. But once you see it, you've got to be aware. Separate your happiness from your God. So when you get that promotion... Rather than shouting, God is great, which is, of course, a, a reasonable thing to shout on any given day, it's your happiness is great. I'm greatly happy. And when you see that disaster, it is not that there is no God. It is that there is no happiness. And it's a perfectly honest and reasonable comment in the face of a true tragedy. My happiness is destroyed. It is gone. It may never even come back. And that's, that is reasonable theology. God is not tied to our happiness. It leads to what I call the challenge of meaningless theology. And I'll say this, uh, I'll phrase it this way and, and, and see if you can resonate with that. If I cannot speak well of my God when my circumstances are painful, does it really count for anything if I speak well of him at any other time? I think that's what matters. Faith shows when you can speak well of God in painful circumstances. To put it another way, by analogy, any fool can sail a ship on calm waters. The real sailors sail at all times. And that's the distinction, I think, uh, between uh, Job and uh, many who have uh, crashed in their faith. It leads to the idea that perhaps we are too focused on our own happiness being uh, testimony to the existence of God or the goodness of God. 
Think about this. This is supposed to be this famous question. I'm sure you all have heard it, which is supposed to be this real brain teaser. If a tree falls in the forest when there is no one around to hear it, does it make a sound? Just reassure me. Raise your hand if you've heard of that before. Have I heard that? Yeah, good. Okay, good. It's well known. Yeah. But in actual fact, let me just, let me just say this. To answer the question, let me just suggest to you that a different species was asking the same question. Because we know in that forest, there are all sorts of species. When we say there's no one around, we mean no human. So let's imagine the squirrels were to postulate such a thing. And one squirrel says to his friend, if a tree falls in the forest, when there's only birds and insects and a few pointless humans standing around to hear it, does it make a sound? And the other squirrel says, whoa, mind-blowing, I've no idea. But you can see how arrogant that question is. All that that question really reveals is the astonishing arrogance of our species that says, well, if I'm not there to witness it, why would it even happen? And yet God reassures us. He says, you know, sometimes I make little flowers bloom where the only eyes to see them are mine. Not every flower that blooms blooms for your pleasure. I make them for my pleasure, and you don't even see them. Who cuts a channel for the torrents of rain and a path for the thunderstorm to water a land where no man lives, a desert with no one in it, to satisfy a desolate wasteland and make it sprout with grass? And God's saying, I do that. It's not done for you. It's done for part of the beauty that I am radiating and resonating with the work that I am doing. And you might not be there to see it, nor your squirrel friend, but that's okay. It's still worth doing. God's justification is not dependent on our approval or even our survival. Either God is good and justified, or he is not. But whether we live or die does not determine which of those questions is answered which way. In fact, here then is something we're going to have to uh, <clears throat> introduce, the doctrine of retribution. I introduce this because it's all throughout the book of Job. This is the false doctrine which has permeated Job and to some extent actually does affect probably every single one of us. The idea that behavior is constantly rewarded by God's intervention. You behave well, God will reward you with good things. You behave poorly, God will punish you with bad times. Uh, more recently, in recent decades, the word karma has been associated uh, with that, that way of thinking, although the original word karma meant something quite else. In, in Buddhist thinking. So it can lead to disenchantment. Job himself, I suggest to you, is slightly infected with this false doctrine. He argues, I have become a laughing stock to my friends, though I called on God and he answered, a mere laughing stock, though righteous and blameless. Now Job was righteous and Job was blameless, but do you notice that he says, because I am righteous and because I am blameless, I should never have been made a laughing stock. In other words, bad things should not have happened to me because I conducted myself well. And he did conduct himself well. But he has fallen a victim, unfortunately, by the, the doctrine of retribution. So it is the theology of retribution that is at odds with experience, not a true belief in God. Only if you believe that good living should provide you with many blessings can a disaster contradict your belief in a loving God? Not actually the belief in God per se. If we truly have resigned our lives and said, God, use me as you will, for good or ill, to work those beautiful things that you do, including the flowers that grow where only you see them, then how then do we retain the right to complain when God says, well, now I need you to go through a little bit of hardship for something I'm doing actually quite over here, and we say, well, that's not fair. That's not right. I was living a good life. Why should I be punished? That's what happened to Job. Job has evidently fallen victim to the doctrine of retribution himself, and it's highly present in his friends. Otherwise, he would never have mentioned his innocence when he spoke of his sufferings, because he would never have coupled the two together. And I appreciate this is quite a, a sort of a philosophical set of thinking, and if this is not to your taste, don't worry, because all of the other classes are going to be heavily biblical. I just want to, to sort of approach this from a sort of left field, as it were, just to get uh, the bigger picture of all the thinking that needs to go into approaching the book of Job. 
Therefore, we must develop a sense of love for God, which is independent of our local contemporary blessings that we experience. And that might be a definition of what faith is. To see the goodness of God, even when there are trials and sufferings on our plate in front of us. The righteous will live by his faith, says Habakkuk, and perhaps that's just a very uh, simple and uh, apposite summary of what I'm trying to say. In a true theology, our depth of faith should not equal our depth of need. You see what I mean when I say that? And then we can be at peace without any present justification. Our friends don't need to see that we actually had a, a, um, a smooth and easy life as a consequence of believing in God. Think about Jesus, right? He was never actually restored at any point during his mortal life. He went all the way to the brink of death, as did Job, and went over it, into death. And that was it. He never had any justification. No one could say, for those who were following Gamaliel and saying, well, you know, if this man is of God, then you know, the Romans will be thrown out by him. But if not, you know, he'll, he'll die and disappear. To them, many of them will say, yes, he died and disappeared. We never saw him again. So, so Gamaliel was right. Good. Jesus of Nazareth, he was, he was no man. That's what it would look like from the external evidence. Sometimes it's good to be popular and we say, oh, yeah, my popularity is testimony to the fact I'm a good person. Sometimes we say the opposite and say, oh, the world hates me, so I must be a good person. Right? And we always find a way to win, right? But most people will say, but at least I have my family and, my family and friends, my core group of people. They always support me. They're always with me. Yeah, Jesus didn't even have those. Even the 12 who were supposed to be with him, or the 11 if you like, they pretty much all ran away. And at the critical moment, there was only two or three at the foot of the cross. His mother, perhaps John, one or two others. That was it. So even saying friends and family, Jesus was the ultimate loser in this respect. Even his friends and family did not stand by him. He lost everything. By whatever metric you use to scale success, he failed on every level in the world's eye in terms of justification in his mortal life. And I think that's useful. What does that teach us? It says, don't use Job's restoration as justification for God. Do you see why? Don't say, oh yeah, well, but God gave, it, gave all the toys back in the end, so he's allowed to beat him up in the meantime. That cannot be right, because it did not happen for Jesus. So that's not a useful explanation. The faithful learn to live with mismatches in their theology and their experiences, not because their theology is wrong, but because the doctrine of retribution is wrong. If you live a good life, you won't necessarily have it easy. In fact, that said, an important uh, caveat, any comment on whether this is just or not, and God behaves justly towards us, must be viewed in the context that the entire universe exists, as far as we're concerned, as a free gift. Right? We did not exist in some other dimension when we, we sort of won a chess match and therefore earned the right to have 45 years of life or whatever. We just popped into existence, as far as we knew. And suddenly this fascinating universe was all around us. Free gift. Everything was free. It was all a free gift. And that person who lived but a few seconds or a few minutes had a few seconds or a few minutes of a free gift. And many of us, all of us in this room, have had a few seconds and a few minutes more even than that. What a wonderful provision that we never earned. All of it a free gift. After Job had prayed for his friends, the Lord made him prosperous again and gave him twice as much as he had before. The Lord blessed the latter part of Job's life more than the first. So do you see why the doctrine of retribution is necessarily a hindrance to speaking well of God? Because that doctrine said, yeah, well, God had to give him that. Because Job hadn't sinned, and God punished him anyway as if he had. So God owed him the restoration. And because God pays the restoration, everything's okay. The books are equal. So... It's the belief in that doctrine which hinders us saying what a wonderful provision from God at the end. We can't say that. We can't speak well of God because we say, no, God owed him that. So only when that doctrine has been flushed out of our minds can we say, yes, okay, I can see that God has done a kind thing here. That's a good thing. Praise God. Only when released from the doctrine of retribution can we speak well of God, which is why the three friends were essentially unable to do so as we'll see. As I say, the other talks will be much less 
what might sound like sort of airy fairy philosophy. So don't worry if that is not uh, so much to your taste. I think it's necessary. Here then, let's go straight in with some, something which is core scripture. This is a proposal I want to make to you, which is going to be very important. I'm going to suggest to you that speaking well of God is a theme in Job. I don't want you to believe me just because I say so. I want to give you some, some core evidence and some very interesting, intriguing evidence. Uh, can anyone remember, without looking down, or you look down everyone, what was the first spoken words, that appear in quotation marks, what were the first words spoken in the book of Job? Silence, because no one wants to get it wrong. <laughs> Absolutely. Well done. What? Where have you been? Pretty close. Very close. The first words that exist in quotation marks, what are they? Have you considered my servant Job? It's also very close up there. It's verse 8, isn't it? I don't know myself. It's not. Ah, there we go. Right, verse 5. Early in the morning, Job would sacrifice a burnt offering for each of his children, thinking, perhaps my children have sinned and cursed God's in, God in their hearts. This was Job's regular custom. So those are the first words that are presented as spoken words in the entire book of Job. What are the last ones? What are the last spoken words? Oh, that's the last ones in chapter 1. In the whole book. Yes, there's more. There's much more. Yeah, that's right. There's 42. Yes, thank you, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Is it to do with Job um, praying for his friends or something like that? It is right around that. Uh, the, the speaker is God. No, it's when you're not spoken well. Yes. Peter, there you go. Excellent. I'm angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. And in case we missed it, it's repeated. You have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. So the very first spoken words of the book, the very last spoken words of the book, are on exactly the same theme. Did you speak what was right about your God? And the entire drama is sandwiched in between those two bookends. And I would say that alone is evidence, not necessarily proof, but is evidence that what you say about your God is a vital theme, possibly even the core theme of what's going on in the book of Job. And it throws up this astonishing question, which challenges me and whether or not you have children, because I don't, but many of you do, is our primary concern what our loved ones say about our God? Is that at the center of your prayers? Whether the morning prayers, the evening prayers, whatsoever, can you honestly say, yeah, when I think about my central prayer, it's I'm concerned with what my loved ones, my spouse, my children, my friends, say about my God. Because if it is, perhaps that's the point at which you actually have something in common with Job. Not suffering, certainly not righteousness and blamelessness, alas. But if you're concerned with what your loved ones say about your God, that's the essence of the character of the man of Job. And that's something that we can access. We don't have to feel uh, completely removed from that amazing man uh, in that sense. We also might want to uh, think of one last thing. This might help. This is uh, some good PR for Job's wife, who otherwise has a bit of a rough, uh, rough time in the expositions, as you might imagine. Maybe that's why the one comment from Job's wife is what it is. Curse God and die. Okay? Speak ill of God and die. Now, I'm not going to suggest to you that that's supposed to be some summary of her entire character. I suspect a righteous man like Job would select a life partner with somewhat more discernment. But maybe that's why that comment is in there, because it's the one comment that she made on the subject of speaking well or ill of God. And so that's why it's included. It is because it is a very important thing. I have just one more... Um, argument to make, and again, I think this is very important again from pure scripture, the book of Job, it, it is a, a common suggestion in, in many pieces of literature and also uh, comes into our community as to whether or not all of this really happened. Okay? Is this just a big poem or a play? Or, or is this actual history? And does it matter one way or the other? 
These questions are genuinely debated in our, in our community, so I wish to speak to that, and I wish to suggest to you my thinking. Um, because when I speak of Job, I might use the word drama quite a lot. But when I say the drama of Job, I do not mean to imply it is a fiction. Okay? So I know I've panicked people in the past when I spoke of the drama of Job. They say, oh, I don't believe in it. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> Please, don't be so dramatic. No. <laughs> Let us consider the various uh, aspects. Now, in favor of uh, an interpretation that says it is fictional poetry, which, which teaches lessons, you will see a very high degree of structure in the dialogue. Do you know what I mean by that? In other words, one person speaks and Job replies and person two speaks and Job replies and person three speaks and Job replies. This is not normal conversation, either in this era or in that. So there is this highly structured, lay it is laid out exactly as a play, there's no doubt about that. So that's in favor of a, a poetic interpretation. The events that occur are, of course, extremely unlikely, as we've read. A messenger Job came to Job and said, I am the only one who has escaped to tell you of this disaster. While he was yet speaking, another messenger came and said, this other disaster has happened. I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. And the third messenger, exactly the same, and the fourth. So statistically, these are unbelievably unlikely events. For sure. That's a given. And the speeches themselves are certainly relayed in poetic form. They're not spoken, spoken uh, words. Let me just give a little example there from chapter 22 and, and there will always be verses on the screen but don't think uh, you're very welcome to follow in, in your Bibles if that's something more comfortable to you think about this as a as, as speech submit to God and be at peace with him in this way prosperity will come to you accept instruction from his mouth and lay up his words in your heart if you return to the Almighty you will be restored if you remove wickedness far from your tent and assign your nuggets to the dust, your gold of Ophir to the rocks in the ravines. Then the Almighty will be your gold, the choicest silver for you. Surely then you will find delight in the Almighty and will lift up your face to God. You will pray to him and he will hear you and you will fulfill your vows, etc. This is relayed, this is not normal conversational speech. It is clearly re read out as poetry. So these three arguments are suggestive that we have uh, a play that could be a fiction. Let's consider the rebuttals. How then shall we address those, those points? Well, in terms of the unlikeliness of what happens in, in Job chapter 1, that is no more statistically unlikely than what happened in the crossing of the Red Sea. Consider the evidence. At the precise moment that Moses raises staff across the sea, a wind blows sufficient to part the waters. The Israelites travel across on, on dry land. The Egyptians pursue. The last foot of the last Israelite comes out unscathed from the dry land. And at precisely that point, the waters reclose and every single Egyptian is drowned. In terms of statistical unlikeliness, it is also extremely statistically unlikely. Therefore, if you can believe in a real Red Sea crossing, then you can believe in a real Job chapter 1. The statistical difference is we know when God operates, he can do precisely what he will. So there's no need to take Job 1 as poetry or not real, when it is no less likely than the crossing of the Red Sea. The friend's words may actually be prepared speeches. It may be that they have assembled on particular days, possibly Sabbaths, and they have come and actually stand at a lectern and give a prepared speech to Job and the audience. And the next week or so, Job gives a prepared speech in rebuttal uh, to what has happened. There was clearly an audience there. So it's quite, and in fact, it's what I do believe. It can't be proven, but it doesn't matter. They are, they are probably prepared speeches rather than just a, a sort of a, an argument around the fireplace and, and, and throwing throwing chairs at each other and sort of thing. And it could well be that they have been reconstructed in retelling. In other words, that in the telling of the story, they were reconstructed in poetic language, when in actual fact, they were conversational speech. To that end, think about this. There's no point in reading a piece of poetry and saying, well, because it's poetry, it probably didn't happen in real life. Because many, many, many poems are based precisely off things that did happen in real life. Indeed, they're the basis of the poetry. So, you know, Lord Tennyson's Charge of the Light Brigade, for example, is a wonderful, wonderful poem, all in the Valley of Death, Road the 600 and such like. You know the, the words. Um, but we're not going to read that poem and say, well, because it's poetry, I suggest that the Charge of the Light Brigade never actually existed. Okay? So there's no reason to do that anymore with the Book of Job. Now let us look at the arguments in favor, just as we, we close out this talk, in favor of a historical interpretation. First of all, it's the appropriate default to take. 
You don't, uh, I wouldn't suggest to you you should read a piece of scripture and say, well, I'll believe it's a myth until something comes along to prove it right. If we're going to trust in the word of God, it's appropriate to say, I'll take each part as literal until some other part of the Bible might come along and tell me not to. So Jesus might say, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. And it's an appropriate de default to say, okay, I'll take that as literal. And it's quite all right because Jesus himself comes along later and says, well, this bread, take, eat, this is my body. And this wine, this is my blood. So the Bible explains its own symbolisms. If it doesn't explain it itself as a symbol, don't uh, necessarily, we shouldn't be so arrogant as to impose that it is. We've also seen that the arguments in favor of it being fictional poetry are largely rebutted. This is an important verse. If you're ever caught up in that discussion, I suggest you take notice of Ezekiel 14 and verse 20, because it says this. God is speaking. I stretch out my hand against Israel, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it. They could save only themselves by their righteousness, declares the Sovereign Lord. Why does that verse help? It helps because if Noah, Daniel, and Job are, measured, are mentioned in the same breath, then by implication, they're all as real as each other. You wouldn't, in any argument, cite three case studies of which two were real people and one was a myth. For example, you wouldn't say, if you're trying to make a case for doing good works, you wouldn't cite Mahatma Gandhi and Mother Teresa and Santa Claus as your three case studies. It's a complete mismatch of... And besides, Gandhi really exists. So that would be, it would be crazy to suggest that Job was mythical in the light of that context. Okay, I think that's an important verse. And this is massive too. Job's suffering has to be real before it provides any solace to an external reader. Right? Consider these words. Here's your option. Either this really happened, or else it's an incredibly powerful play. Job is speaking. If only my anguish could be weighed, it would surely outweigh the sand of the seas. The night drags on and I toss till dawn. My body is clothed with worms and scabs. My skin is broken and festering. My breath is offensive to my wife. I am loathsome to my own brothers. He goes on to say, I cry out to you, O God, but you do not answer. Now, how can any of us who experiences a modicum or a reduced version of any of these problems take comfort in the book of Job if we are to look at it and say, yeah, but it was, only a, it was only a poem made up by someone. It never really happened. Then you have no ability to take solace in the comfort of knowing that there is a man who has walked before and has suffered much more before. And finally, in favor of a historical in interpretation, hopefully it's an obvious point. God speaks. This is massive. Okay? They're the longest speeches by Almighty God anywhere in the scriptures. Now either this is God really speaking, or else this is a man who is writing a play saying, well, I'll now write the God part. What use then are those speeches of God? They are worth no more than if I wrote them. They are worth nothing at all. So this must be real history. Something that as we go through this book of Job, we will realize the events on the page in front of us really happened. So try and make them real to you, however objectionable, however painful that may be, particularly for those of you who have also suffered greatly. I suggest to you this is a historical recount, and the speeches of poetry are probably merely recapitulated when they are rewritten in poetic form. So that is my suggestion to you, and we then come to the point where we'll pick up tomorrow, where we reach uh, an extraordinary thing. Satan comes amongst the children of God. Who then is this Satan? I will say this much at this point. The interpretation that we take of Satan is going to be absolutely critical. It will change massively what the whole book of Job means. And so I don't want to be dogmatic. I'm lucky enough that already in our own community several different theories exist. So I can't realistically get stoned for mine. That's great. I like that. Gives me a little protection. The guy coming up with theory number two always gets attacked. Theory number five, you're safe. Okay. But I'm going to suggest to you what I think the Satan to be, and, I'm, and hopefully I'll be able to bring across why I think it is absolutely vital to see that interpretation, because otherwise the book becomes entirely less powerful and has a lot of 
loose ends spinning off that never get resolved. So that's where we're going to pick up tomorrow. And, and no more philosophy from tomorrow. Tomorrow we hit the scriptures and we hit them hard. Thank you.